This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 35, Diagonalizable Matrices. Our objectives for this lecture are to compute powers of a diagonal matrix, compute powers of a diagonalizable matrix, A equals P, D, P inverse, and understand the statement and proof of the diagonalization theorem. So a square matrix D is diagonal if its only non-zero entries are on that main diagonal. So in this case, we have a diagonal 4 by 4 matrix, and notice that the diagonal entries themselves may be zero, but the only non-zero entries are on that main diagonal. Now finding powers of diagonal matrices is easy. All we need to do is compute that power of each diagonal entry. So for example, if D is the 2 by 2 diagonal matrix, negative 2, 0, 0, 3, let's find a formula for D to the K, where K is a positive integer. We'll start with D squared. D squared means D times D, so in the normal way, we go across the rows of the first matrix and down the columns of the second, multiplying and adding as we go, and we get the result 4, 0, 0, 9, which is in fact negative 2 squared, 0, 0, 3 squared. To compute d cubed, we can either multiply d squared times d or d times d squared. Either way is going to give us the same result. And again, this matches up with our formula, where we get negative 2 cubed, 0, 0, 3 cubed. And so continuing in this way, we could demonstrate and prove to ourselves that d to the k is in fact negative 2 to the k, 0, 0, 3 to the k. And this works for diagonal matrices of any size. Now, an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if A equals P times D times P inverse for some invertible matrix P and some diagonal matrix D. And similar to diagonal matrices, finding powers of diagonalizable matrices is also relatively simple. If we multiply A to the K, that means we're multiplying P, D, P inverse to the K, which means we're multiplying P times D times P inverse by itself K times. Now you might think this would work out to be p to the k, d to the k, p inverse to the k, but that doesn't work because matrix multiplication is not commutative. We can't rearrange all these letters to put all the p's together, put all the d's together, and so on. So instead what we'll do is realize that every time we have a p inverse and a p next to each other, those will cancel out. And so what we get is a p at the start, which doesn't have a p inverse to cancel out with, a p inverse at the end, which doesn't have a p to cancel out with, and then k copies of d in the middle, which works out to be p times d to the k times p inverse. And d is diagonal, which means d to the k is easy to compute, so a to the k is also relatively easy to compute. Let's try out an example. It turns out that the 2 by 2 matrix negative 27, 50, negative 15, 28 is diagonalizable, with a equaling p, d, p inverse, where p and d are the matrices that you see here. Remember, p is invertible and d is diagonal. So let's use this information to find a formula for a to the k, where k is a positive integer. Now a is p, d, p inverse, and we were given p and d, but we weren't given p inverse. So let's compute that. We could use the row reduction algorithm that we learned for finding inverses, but we could also use the formula that we had for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix, which you can see here. Plugging in the values from the entries of p, we get that p inverse is the matrix 3, negative 5, negative 1, 2. Now, as we saw before, a to the k is p times d to the k p inverse, and d to the k is just raising the diagonal entries of d to the k power. So now we just need to multiply. We've got three matrices to multiply together. We can only multiply them two at a time, so let's start by multiplying the first two together. We could also start by multiplying the second and the third matrices together, but I'll do the first two. We get this result here, and then finally we multiply these two by two matrices together to get this admittedly complicated looking formula for a to the k. Now that might seem like a lot of work, but again, imagine that we could use this formula for k equals 1,000, and all we would need to do is plug 1,000 into this formula. That would be very easy to do computationally as compared to multiplying this matrix A by itself 1,000 times. So even though it's a bit of work to get a formula like this, it saves us a lot of work if what we're interested in is big powers of our matrix. Now when is a matrix diagonalizable? This theorem tells us. The diagonalization theorem says that an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And in addition, whenever A is diagonalizable, with A equaling P, D, P inverse, the columns of P are linearly independent eigenvectors of A, and the diagonal entries of D are the corresponding eigenvalues for those eigenvectors. So this theorem says a lot, but we're going to go through the proof of it. 
So one way to think about what this theorem is saying is that A is diagonalizable if and only if there are enough eigenvectors of A to form a full basis for Rn. Such a basis is called an eigenvector basis for Rn. But as we're going to see, not every matrix has an eigenvector basis. And in the next lecture, we're going to learn more about how to tell when a matrix does or doesn't have an eigenvector basis. Now here we see the key observation that's going to help us prove this theorem. If P is any n by n matrix whose columns are V1 through Vn, and D is any diagonal matrix with diagonal entries lambda1 through lambda n, so now I'm not saying that these are eigenvectors or eigenvalues, I'm just saying that these are any matrices. Multiplying A times P just gives us the matrix whose columns are AV1, AV2, and so on. That's just the definition of multiplying a matrix times another matrix. We multiply the first matrix individually by the columns of the second matrix. Now when we multiply P times D, the result is multiplying each column of P by the corresponding diagonal entries of D. Let's see why that is. Well, the ith column of the diagonal matrix D is just lambda i times E i, where E is the standard basis vector. And so the ith column of P D is P times that ith column of D, again using the definition of matrix multiplication, but that works out to be lambda i V i, and that proves that P D is the formula that you see here. Okay, now let's get into the proof of the theorem. The theorem is an if and only if, so let's start by assuming that A is diagonalizable. That means that A equals P D P inverse for some invertible matrix P and some diagonal matrix D. But if we multiply both sides by P on the right, that gives us A P equals P D. So that means the two formulas that we had on the previous slide are going to be equal, and that means that A V I equals lambda I times V I for all I. Well, those equations show that the columns of P, the V's, are eigenvectors of A. And remember that for the definition of eigenvector, those vectors had to be non-zero, but P is an invertible matrix, so it can't have any zero vectors as its columns, and so these really are non-zero eigenvectors of A. And since P is invertible, its columns must also be linearly independent by the invertible matrix theorem, and therefore the columns of P are n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. Now going the other direction, now we're going to assume that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors, and we need to prove that A is diagonalizable. We need to prove that A equals P D P inverse. So we'll suppose that A has those eigenvectors, and let's let P be the matrix whose columns are the V's, and D be the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are the lambdas. Well, by the definition of eigenvector, A V I equals lambda I times V I, which means that the matrix A P equals the matrix P D. So what we'd like to do at this point is multiply by P inverse on the right. But why is P invertible? Well, its columns are the n linearly independent vectors that we started with. An n by n matrix with n linearly independent columns must be invertible by the invertible matrix theorem. And so we can multiply by P inverse on the right, which gives us A equals P D P inverse. And that proves that A is diagonalizable. Now we've already seen that one application of a matrix being diagonalizable is that it's easier to find a formula for the kth power of that matrix. One application of that we can see here with the Fibonacci numbers. If you haven't seen these before, the Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of integers where we add two consecutive entries of the sequence to get the next one. So the sequence starts out with 1, 1, and then we add 1 plus 1 and get 2, we add 1 plus 2 to get 3, we add 2 plus 3 to get 5, and so on. And you can see the rest of the sequence here. Now we can model this Fibonacci sequence using linear algebra. We're going to use vectors with two entries that contain two consecutive entries of the sequence. And so what you can see here is that we start out with the two ones, and then we're going to shift the upper number into the lower position, and then add the two numbers in our vector together to get the new top number. And then we shift down, add to get the next top, and so on. And so you can see here that in each of these vectors we get a pair of consecutive Fibonacci numbers that we add together to get the next Fibonacci number. And it turns out that this transformation of vectors is a linear transformation. If we use the matrix capital F, which is 1, 1, 1, 0, we can model this transition from one vector to the next by multiplying by this matrix. And again, you can see the top entries shifting to the bottom position and adding the two entries together to get the new top position. Now this gives us a formula of sorts for the nth Fibonacci number. We multiply the matrix F to the n times our starting vector F0, which is just 1, 1. But that formula requires us to raise that matrix to the nth power. And the good news here is that the matrix F is in fact diagonalizable, which means we're going to be able to find a formula for F to the n like we did back in example one. So it turns out that the eigenvalues for F are 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 and 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. 
we'll often use the Greek letter phi, or phi, depending on how you like to pronounce it, to represent that number. And that number is also called the golden ratio. It's approximately 1.618 and so on. And it has a lot of other interesting mathematical properties. So doing a bit of work here, just like we did back in example one, we can get a formula for the matrix f to the n. And then we multiply that matrix times our starting vector 1, 1 to get a formula for f sub n, which is 1 over square root of 5 times phi to the n plus 1 minus phi hat to the n plus 1. And this technique can be adapted. We can use this process to find so-called closed formulas for all sorts of recursive sequences. And we can also adapt this technique to solve certain kinds of differential equations. So this diagonalization is quite useful. So now, we know that an n by n matrix is diagonalizable if and only if it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So this gives us two big questions. If A is diagonalizable, how do we find these eigenvectors? How do we actually do the diagonalization? And how do we determine if a square matrix is not diagonalizable? And we're going to answer those questions in the next lecture. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.